I think and that's probably exactly what they needed to hear. Uh, I'll just repeat <laughs> to them on a weekly basis that you're going to fail sometimes and it's fine. Yep. I want to pivot to the piece that you wrote. Yeah. Um, and before or as we do that, I want to share the poem because I know that some of them probably haven't had a chance to look at the piece yet. So here's the text of the piece. Uh, it's by James Weldon Johnson. Um, he's uh, probably most famous, although Marcus, you can correct me, for having written the lyrics to the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, but he was a writer in the first half of the 20th century who wrote a lot of different stuff. Um, so here's the, here's the sonnet. Starts out, my heart be brave and do not falter so. Um, and uh, you should go listen to all your individual rehearsal videos and we kind of take the text apart a little bit. But uh, Marcus, do you want to just talk a little bit about um, about the piece? So how you found the poetry, what your compositional process was, like did you start at the beginning, did you start at the end, do you compose vertically, horizontally, some combination of all of those? Um, and then after you talk about your process a little bit, if there's anything you want us to keep in mind while we're singing it. So, um this all started from a competition. <laughs> so uh, I presented at Eastern Division two years prior. Um, so yeah, 2018. Um, presented on the uh, non-idiomatic choral music of Black composers. And at can one you of all, the- Can you explain to them what non- Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that's um, okay. Uh, Non-idiomatic, when it refers to Black composers, is the music that does not have what we consider an idiomatic influence or anything that would necessarily sound Black. Uh, the musical styles that were that we know were created by those of African descent. So when it comes to music, mo especially concert music, more formally, it tends to be spirituals, um, jazz, even gospel. But I mean, you know, of course, I mean hip hop and blues and all those other styles that are associated. Um, so what I've found over the past few years, especially once attending um, predominantly white institutions was that um, they just didn't know about that music. We did it at historically black colleges. I mean, they still do all the time. And that's how I just became familiar with it. So it was presenting on that topic in Pittsburgh and Dr. Uh, Tressa King was at the session and he was like man he was like i this is a great topic he said uh next year uh next season i will have concerts with seraphic fire and i would love if you could write a piece you know for us to to do with those performances and i was like uh, of course so i'm just um, going to interject that seraphic fire is a professional choir down in miami it's uh it's one of maybe only half a dozen um professional choirs at that level. So it's they're they're kind of on the level of Chanticleer and Consperare. Oh definitely. Um and yeah. they um just so everybody knows who they, they are. Grammy nominated. Yeah. And um as a sidebar, somebody uh, I can't remember who um it might have been like Charles Bruffy or uh Craig Hella Johnson um said that out of all of the professional choirs in the United States, they pretty much all have the same roster and because yeah. You, you just have the same people who just like fly from Miami to then go to Phoenix. Um, yeah. But some of them will fly down to Texas to be with Conspirare and then others will fly up to South Dakota to be with South Dakota Chorale and others may go out with the uh, LA Massacre. I mean, it's just like, yeah. just a small circle. But but yeah, so uh, Dr. Tressa King um, was doing a concert of music, uh, basically all about the Black experience. And... Um, he is, he really enjoys doing the music uh, that has like a social justice theme. And so he had been choosing, he asked me if there was a way for me to find, you know, text that had something to do with that. And I was just like, okay, we'll see. Now I love when I can doing, excuse me, uh, using the poetry of, of black, black poets. Um, so I've, I've used uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and uh, James Weldon Johnson a few times. Um, how I found this one, I think it really was just me like skimming through just several poems by, by Johnson. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I, I'm sure that I looked past it first and then eventually came back to it. And just thinking about um, uh, there was power in making for the right um, about, for me, it was thinking about the fact that no matter what is going on in the world, and even if people may disagree with you, if you know that this is the right thing to do for other people, that's what you need. That, that, that should be your mission. Um, so um, when it came down to the, the actual compositional process, um, I've written pieces in so many different ways. Sometimes it's been 100% using finale. Other times it's been 100% at the piano, 100% um, just pencil and paper. I mean, combination of the two. I started out vertically and then I learned theory and then it started being more horizontal because I just love analyzing chords. I love that kind of stuff. So then I found that my music was really like that. And so with, as of late, I've tried to kind of marry the two to do the, the uh, horizontal and the vertical. But I find sometimes even in like singing a melody, there are still these underpinnings of the harmonics that, that or the harmonies that I will use. Um, so I, yeah, I wrote that piece all, almost all in my office at the piano. But every now and then I might be uh, driving or walking or something and the poem would come back to mind and a melody would get attached to it. So then I, you know, go to the voice memos and sing some of that. And sometimes I remember to go back to it. Other times I forget. <laughs> but um, I did go back. Uh, I don't remember which parts, but I remember going back to, to one of those voice memos because uh, I remembered uh, some of that. And, um, and yeah, I've started out... I, I, if I remember, remember correctly, because this was in the stretch of, I had five commissions in the course of uh, just a little over a year, and I've never had that many, ever. So um, some details may bleed together, just because it was like, bam, I'm done with this, I gotta go to the next piece. Oh, gotta go to the next piece, gotta go to the next piece. Um, but from what I remember, I wrote that piece just front to back. Um, there have been some times, I remember writing a piece in graduate school where I had the beginning and the end and I was with my composition teacher. He was like, you know, there's nothing wrong necessarily with doing it that way, but then you often have to wrestle even more with trying to find what's going to connect the two. Um, nope, you know what, now that I think about that, no, I did not write this one completely front to back. There was that middle section um, right before the look up. Well, it, yeah, we can go to it, so. Yeah, so like the section right before that, that was the last section that I did. Yeah, let's see. So this one. Yeah. So it was like, how do I get from tears dark is that I just heard this one? And I was like, hmm, oh, okay, yeah. And so it kind of, I had a feel, I was like, what kind of transitional stuff is going to happen right here? Um, so that did give me a little bit of, um, and there was a little bit of work I had to do with that. But um, with the piece, this piece was really about um, a lot, it was a lot about the, uh, the horizontal because I sang a lot of this to myself. Um, there was a Coral Journal article that one day I'm going to find again. It was with, uh, there was an interview with a, a female composer. Um, I want to say it was either Gwyneth Walker or Libby Larson, um, but I could be wrong. But either way, she said that when she's setting text, the first thing she does is sit with the text and find the natural rhythms that are in it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that stuck with me. Um, and especially after I sat under some conductors who were a little more intentional about like syllabic stress and the like, then I realized there are some songs that are so much easier to sing because the composer said it so naturally. It, it, it flows rhythmically to how we would speak it, which as we know, 
was the gold, you know, like with, with the opera. Mm -hmm. And like when it first got started, I mean, they were, it, they were trying to match speech. So I tried to do that um, quite a bit more now. Um, most times I try to put the important words on the stronger beats. Doesn't always happen, but I try. I try my best uh, to do that. And so it's really just about speaking through the text, finding those natural rhythms, and then in the midst of those natural rhythms, then allowing the music to just come out like it is. So like that section right there that we're looking at the look up and all the beyond surrounding cloud. I mean, that, I didn't have to write that. It was just like, boom, here it is. Certain things just happen. Um, I saw a review of one of the concerts that Seraphic Fire did with this. And somebody, whoever the person was, said that this piece um, basically was very contemporary sounding um, in that it had a lot of the um, like memorable melodic ideas that you kind of would expect of uh, a piece that, I mean, uh, something that might even be in like a songwriting style. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just like, oh, okay. Didn't even think about that. But I can definitely see how, I mean, it's not, I was not trying to be adventurous or um, innovative in any way with this piece because um, Dr. Tressa King said, if you write this piece, so uh, at a, um, maybe don't try to just, be advanced just because you know it's seraphic fire like don't just try to write something difficult so that right. if you write something that's a little more accessible it's like i can then do it with boston children's chorus and i was like oh okay and he did and then i found that video on youtube just like two three days ago and i was like what yeah so great oh man they, they sound did he tell you he was doing it with that ensemble so, I mean, he did it on YouTube all of a sudden. Now, I didn't realize that it was, um, like I said, I just happened to somehow I, it was like in a Google search or something. And I was like, what is this? And um, now he told me he was going to do it. And when I went, I was in Boston back in May. Yeah, May. And he actually uh, gave me a tour of the facilities for uh, BCC. And every time he introduced me to somebody, he was like, this is the guy that wrote my Harvey Brave. And I'm like, oh, you know, so nice to meet you. Um, so, I mean, I knew that the piece had been done, but I didn't necessarily know um, what people thought about it or anything. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I was just like, okay, this is, okay, this is, this is nice. And then to hear that recording, and I was just like, wow. And ready to be like City Opera House. I'm like, well, all right. <laughs> not complaining so uh so yeah just grateful grateful for that so yeah i mean the, um with, with the piece it was really uh about me getting something out uh, it, it so it served uh, two purposes i mean one to to fulfill his request for something that could fit uh, along with that i mean i when i had chosen the text i sent it to him and he was like this is perfect like i know exactly where this is going to go in the program i was like cool and um and then again it was for me to write it so that both a professional choir and a children's choir could do it it's like all right or a college choir definitely in anywhere in between 